Listen, I'm not anybody. I'm not anybody special. I'm just Sullivan. It's all I am. But make no mistake, God knows who I am. The Apostle Paul, I quote it all the time, said, I am what I am by the grace of God. You're clay and he's a potter and he'll make you what he wants you to be if you'll let him. A vessel of what? Honor. Meat for the master's use. My God, to pour you full of the Holy Ghost and pour you out to a world that's thirsting and starving to death. Brother Ed Wilson came through here and preached for us one Sunday morning. Never heard Brother Corey preach. All he did is listen to him and Kirsten sing. Went and took him to lunch afterwards. Uh, he said, I hope you don't mind. He said, but I got my eye on your son-in-law. He said, man, there's a hundred churches out there in this district that's aching for a young man like that that lives a pure life. That's a man of resolve, a man of integrity, a man of the word. He said, I'd, li I'd like to place him in one of them churches. I said, well, the only thing I mind about that is I want it to be the will of God. I don't want you just to stick him in any church. I want it to be the church that God's called him to be in. Because right now he's where God wants him to be. God's doing in him what God wants to do in him, just like he did in me when I was under my pastor. I said, and when God's work is complete and he's done everything doing him here, God will have the place. He'll know it, I'll know it, and you'll know it. Amen. But he, I'm telling you, he was drawn to him like a magnet. Amen. I, I went to teach one of the, uh, uh, one of the ordination classes and, and Sister Edna. They've never heard me preach. All they've done is been around me. I've been around them. They've preached for me. I've ate lunch with them. I've been in services with them and around them. But when she introduced me to the class, this is Brother Sullivan, pastors in Foley, been down there for X amount of years. She said, my husband and I, when we were trying to determine who was going to preach this pastoral ministry class, we both come to the agreement. Brother Eddie's perfect for it. And they said, want you to give your undivided attention to him. We believe he's the most Pentecostal man in our district. And I said, well, I'm going to take that as a compliment because I kind of like being Pentecostal. Hey, I, we sang it, but I, I want to live it. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Oh, no, you're one of them tongue talkers. You got me guilty as charged. Well, man, if you wouldn't talk in all them tongues, you could pack it out over there. You got it wrong. You got it wrong. They come out of the upper room speaking in other tongues. Men and brethren said, what meaneth this? 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom in one day. You can draw a crowd. Amen. You can. A circus can draw a crowd. But it don't mean people get born again. A ball game draw a crowd. A much bigger crowd than a church will. Just go to any university on Saturday. They can draw a big, big crowd. They got little girls that barely got any clothes on with pom-poms out there. They can draw a crowd. Amen. They can draw a crowd. But it don't mean they're there looking for Jesus. You can do a lot of things different, preacher. Have a bigger church. I'm going to be Pentecostal. I'm going to be full of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to be a man of principle. I'm going to stay with God's Word and refuse to eat the meat offered to idols and the wine offered to idols. And I'm just going to stay with the book. And there might only be a few of you, but my God, there'll be an excellent spirit in you. Whoa! There'll be found in you wisdom and knowledge and understanding like no other people on the planet. 
Glory to God. I want to tell you, doors will open that God will walk you through that other men won't ever know exist. You'll see things and hear things and experience things in the kingdom of God that other people only read about in a book. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I want to walk with Him in reality. I don't want to just read about it. I want to experience it for myself. Amen. This is how I dare to be different. Whether slave or free, in Titus 2 and 9, exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining nor showing all, or but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. He's telling me, even if you're a slave, he said, be the best one the Lord of that house has ever seen. You ever heard of a boy named Joseph? No, Potiphar said, my God, the hand of God's on that boy. He elevated him all the way to the top and said, I want you to oversee all of my affairs. You're over everything in my house. It's all yours except for my wife. And I know you won't ever mess with her or bother her or lay a hand on her. And he didn't. Amen. Why? Potiphar knew. That boy could be trusted, even a slave. Listen, people who maintain purity in their dealings with others are often given positions of great responsibility and privilege because they can be trusted to use those privileges wisely. Yes, Daniel's a man of purpose, principle, and purity, and the world needs more people like him. But the element that likely tied all these things together in such a way as to receive God's blessing and favor is the fact that number four, Daniel was a man of prayer. Daniel was a man of prayer. If you could have asked me, how do I become a man of purpose, a man of principle? Amen. How, how do I attain all of these in my life? You need to have a relationship with God. This ongoing, your, your devotion should be daily. Praying always. Praying always. Making supplication unto God. Praying without ceasing. Amen. Walking in the Spirit. Has to be maintained with a life of prayer. If you want to know that to be a surety, then you walk with Jesus through the four Gospels. Everywhere He went, He prayed. Everything he did, he prayed beforehand. When he got through working miracles, he turned aside, went aside, and he prayed. I found the moment that we're most susceptible to the devil, to his tricks, or to our flesh, is after some of the greatest, most anointed, power-filled, Holy Ghost-filled services you've ever been in. We tend to let our guard down we tend to feel like, man, we did it. And we're not praying just like Elijah when he prayed and the fire of God fell. It's right after that that Jezebel said, I'll kill you. I'll kill you like you did them prophets for some reason. Right after the greatest victory in his life, he went through the greatest depression he had ever experienced. Because he quit praying. My God, son, you just prayed the fire down. She said she's going to kill you. Then make you another altar. And pray again. But he found him a juniper tree. And he laid down. And he said, I just want to die. I just want to quit. Here's something. Did God kill him? No. God's merciful to him. And I want to tell you this. Brother Clendon had pointed this out. I'd never seen it before. He said, be careful. When that spirit comes on you, that you pray through over it. He said, because when he's under that juniper tree praying, Oh God, I'm no better than my forefathers. Let me die. Let me die. 
And God wouldn't let him die in that state. That's not a good state to die in. I don't believe God's going to rapture the church either in some weak, anemic state. I believe God's going to pour His Spirit out upon us. He's coming back after a church that's made herself ready, adorned herself, amen, with the gifts and the power of the Holy Ghost, clothed upon, endued with power. That word endued means to be cloaked or to be clothed. Amen. He's coming back after a bride that's made herself ready. She's adorned. She's cloaked in power. She's preaching salvation by the blood of Jesus. Uh, oh, she's preaching a pure, uncompromised uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. She is operating in the gifts and the power of the Holy Ghost. She's not ashamed of her Lord. She's doing the Great Commission. That's the bride he's coming back for. Amen. But when he's under that juniper tree praying to die, God's merciful and sends him an angel and said, No, journey's too great. Got one, got one more thing I need you to do. I need you to rise up and eat. Gave him, gave him angel, angel food. Baked on coals of fire. Gave him drink. Wouldn't let him die. He said, I want you to rise. I want you to go. I want you to anoint Elisha, prophet in your stead. Hey, if you're constantly telling God, I don't want to, if you're constantly telling God, I can't do this anymore, if you're constantly telling God, I'd rather die than have to pastor that church. I'd rather die than have to try to lead a bunch of people that don't want anything from God. I'm telling you, the devil has come against me in this last year in personal attacks, in personal ways, me dealing with stuff, not church related, personal related, that I never thought in a million years sometimes that I would have to deal with. I'm telling you, I was uh, uh, deer hunting, but I wasn't hunting. I just, I just need to get away from the house. And I was sitting in the box and I was crying. Just crying, looking out and staring at that field. And a demon from hell, Brother Daniel, I was sitting in that box. He knew. He just knew. There ain't no way this boy will take his own life. He just ain't, he just ain't gonna do that. This is what he told me. If you don't have to take your own life, God loves you. If you would ask God, He'd just let a heart attack come upon you. He'll just let you stop breathing while you're in your sleep and peacefully pass away. You'll be in heaven. You won't have to worry about any of this anymore. If I were you, I'd just pray and ask God, Lord, just let me die. And the Holy Ghost said, you better not pray that. I've not given you a spirit of fear, he said, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. It's not sound to be praying to die. To be praying for God just put me out of my misery. I'm like a horse with a broke leg. I can't run this race anymore. Just put me down. You better be careful if you pray that prayer. So you know what? If you won't do it, God will find somebody else who will. No, he didn't kill Elisha. But Elisha went and cast that mantle or Elijah went and uh, cast that mantle on Elisha. And Elisha took up. Eli I'm telling you, right after that, Elijah's ministry was over. God called him on up. Your time is over. Your time is through. You've anointed another man prophet in your place. Uh, I don't want somebody else to do my work. I don't want you to have to do what God called me to do. No, but I want to be faithful. How? If we'll pray, we'll stay. If we'll pray, we'll stay. In Daniel 6 and 10, he knelt in prayer. A demonstration of his humility. He prayed three times a day as a demonstration of his continual dependence upon God. 
He gave thanks as he did aforetime. Gave thanks. Man, he's a slave. He's captive in a foreign land. He was carried away as a teenager, no fault of his own. He's an old man. You know how long they were there before God sent them back home? Seventy years. If he was 15 years old when he was taken away, and I'm just guessing as a teenager, he's 85 years old, but he's giving God thanks. He's been kept by a mighty strong hand. While other men have died at the edge of the sword, it hadn't come nigh. It has not come near Daniel. Amen. While other men were starving, while other men were on the end of a, of a lash, of a whip, while other men were in prison, Daniel was in the king's court doing the king's business. The Spirit of God was upon him to interpret dreams and visions. He was still God's man wherever he was. I want to be God's man in the church house. I want to be God's man if it be in the courthouse. I want to be God's man if I'm in the schoolhouse. I want to be God's man if I'm Paul and Silas in the jailhouse. I want to be God's man when I'm with my wife and children in my house. You have to be different. While everybody else is entertaining their self, while everybody else is sleeping, the sleep of sorrow, as good a men as they were, Brother Daniel, Peter, and James, and John, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, Hey guys, watch with me. The weight of the whole world is crushing me. I'm, I'm sorrowful. Even unto death, I need some men to hold me up, to cover me in prayer. And when he came back, he found them sleeping for sorrow. It's just too much, Lord. There's too much grief. There's too much hurt. There's too much pain. There's too much pressure. Sleep. Sleep is a product. Sleep is a fruit. Sleep is a work of prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Nobody on board of that ship rocking, being tossed in the sea, in the ocean. It's taking on water. It's about to go down. Seafaring men that do this for a living are scared for their life. They've never seen such a storm in all of their days. We're done. I mean, it's over for us. Everybody is on deck. Everybody is alert. And the captain says, uh, I don't know what religion y'all are, but somebody better touch God. We're going down. Is everybody on deck? Is everybody praying? Is everybody calling on God? And they said, not one old boy down in the bottom of the boat. He's sound asleep. Sleep. Who in the world can sleep? Through this, I asked the Lord that one time. I said, Lord, how could he sleep? Jesus slept because he wasn't moved by the storm. He was in the Father's will. He was walking and had perfect peace. He could sleep because the storm didn't bother him. He knew he was there in the Father's will. But Jonah's out of the Father's will. How could he sleep? He didn't have no peace. There is no peace, saith God, to the wicked he was following his own wicked and pernicious ways by running from God, running from Nineveh. I asked the Lord, how could Jonah sleep? And the Lord spoke this to my heart in prayer, and he said, he's drunk. Take a drunk man to sleep through a hurricane on a boat. I said, God, the Bible don't say that. He said, not drunk with wine, son, intoxicated with sin. Drunk on the world. Heart dis, uh, just hardened by the deceit of sin. Intoxicated with that fruit that Eve and Adam took hold of. The fruit of sin. The fruit of selfishness. The fruit of carnality. He's drunk in his own pernicious ways. How could a man, Samson, lay his head down in a woman's lap? She tells him. 
Show me where your great strength lies. Tell me the secret of your strength. Every time he tells her something, she afflicts him. She binds him. He jumps up and casts those, you know, the, those ties, those binds that she tries to bind him. And he breaks them like they're nothing. She said, you're not telling me your whole heart. How can you say you love me when you won't show me all of your heart? He said, okay, the only consecration left I've got. I've never let a razor come upon this. I broke every other vow, but I'm still holding out. I've never let a razor come. I thought to myself, dear God, son, she's tried to tell you about five or six times. She wants to kill you. Why in the world are you laying your head in her lap? Why are you doing that? And God said, he's drunk. Intoxicated with sin. Listen, sleep. Sleep is a product of prayerlessness. If you don't pray, this world will intoxicate you. Every day you're exposed to it. Every day you drink it in. The righteous lot vexed himself with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked. He wasn't a homosexual, but he didn't care that they were. He wasn't a homosexual, but he didn't care that his daughters were mixing in with that world. He and his wife were not homosexuals, but they were so in love with the world, it took an angel of God to drag them out. God. We're not praying. We'll become intoxicated. We're not praying we'll sleep the sleep of death. We're not praying. Sleep is a byproduct of it. Amen. Jesus said, if the watchman had known what hour the thief would have come, he wouldn't have suffered his house to be broken into. He said, watch and pray, lest he come suddenly and find you sleeping. If you're asleep when the rapture takes place, oh, Peter and James and John, they were good men, but they were not praying men. Jesus said, so the scripture can be fulfilled, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep are going to be scattered. He said, you men are going to run like scalded dogs when they come to arrest me. You men are going to forget you ever knew me. You're going to be scared and hiding, ashamed. You're going to deny me. Peter said, whoa, 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 time out. You got me mistaken with somebody else. I mean, come on, Lord. I was the first disciple you chose. I mean, I was the first one you caught. I've been with you longer than anybody. It's me, Peter, Simon Barjona. Hey, I will go to prison. They can even put me to death. But I will never deny you, he said, Peter, before the cock crows in the morning, you will have denied me three times already. He said, pray that you enter not into temptation. He didn't trust Peter to pray. He said, Satan has desired to have you. But I've prayed for you. You won't pray, but I will. I want to thank God. Do you hear me? I want to thank God that I serve a risen Savior who's ascended back to the right hand of God, who ever lives to make intercession for me. I want you to hear this, and I'm closing at the Last Supper. Before he was to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, he said, with great desire I have desired to eat this supper with you, this Passover meal with you. For I will not eat or drink again with you until we eat and drink it new in the kingdom of God. I read that. I said, Lord, what in the world? You won't eat that Passover meal with them again until you eat and drink it new in the kingdom of God. Jesus has been on a 2,000 year fast. 
He's not going to eat or drink again, he said, until he does it with us at the marriage supper of the Lamb. He did it with them on that day at the Last Supper. The next time he sups with us, he'll be at the marriage supper. He's been on a 2,000 year fast. What's he been doing? He's at the right hand of the Father praying. I'm talking to you about a praying Jesus. He prayed in his earthly ministry before, during, and after he did anything and everything. And he's been praying ever since he ascended back to the right hand of God. If you want to live, if you want to stand, if you want to be a man or a woman of God, you need to settle tonight in your mind. I'm going to commit myself to pray, to seek the face of Almighty God. Person, if you come help me, I'm finished. Prayer was his custom. His persistence, his faithfulness in his service to God. Is it not likely that his custom to pray so diligently helped him to remain a man of purpose, principle, and purity despite his rise to power and his preeminence over the empire? He kept on praying. Christians do well to follow Daniel's example. Let us learn the lesson that the finest of God's servants must maintain regular and fixed prayer habits in order to continue steadfast devotion to Jesus Christ. As Christians were to pray often in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, pray without ceasing. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Colossians 4 and 2, continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. And our efforts to live purposeful, principled, pure lives. If our lives are not what they should be, could it be because we're undisciplined in prayer? Could that be the reason? Daniel determined. Daniel purposed. He was a man of principle. He was a man of purity. But he was who he was because of his God. You ever heard the saying, you are what you eat? Heard Brother Daryl Turner say one time, he said, I was praying just in my personal prayer time in a prayer meeting. He said, and I was talking to God, and he said, Lord, I want to be holy. He said, I live in a world, I'm surrounded by people. They've got lists and rules of do's and don'ts. And I can't be as holy as this bunch, and I'm too holy for this bunch over here. I don't even know which set of rules, which set of laws, and which set of principles, and which set of convictions that I'm supposed to live by please you Lord but I do want to please you I want to be holy please Lord make me holy and he said the Lord spoke to me and said if you want to be holy you stay in the presence of a holy God and I'll make you like I am you'll walk like me you'll talk like me I'll put my heart my mind my word and my spirit in you. And they'll call you a Christian. And you'll be holy. They called them Christians first in Antioch. Because they found them to be like Jesus. Those people had to have prayed. Paul said, I found them to be more honorable than any other people I'd preached to. Because after I preached to them, they went home and searched the scriptures see whether what I preached to them was the truth or not. Those folk had to be praying, oh God, give us truth. Oh God, talk to us through the Word of God. Oh God, make us all together like you are. I dare to be different. A man in whom the Spirit of God lives and dwells. They said of Daniel, a man in whom is an excellent spirit. A one, a man concerning his ways or concerning the law, our laws, he's not a lawbreaker. 
You know, the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. If you'll be a Christian, you won't ever land yourself in jail again. Come on here. (laughs) Not unless they make a law saying you can't witness, you can't preach, you can't pray, you can't read your Bible. You can't go to church. If they ever make them kind of laws, we'll be in jail. But concerning the laws of the land, he said, if you'll be a Christian, if you'll let God dwell in your heart, you won't ever land yourself in jail because you won't ever commit murder. Come on. You won't put things in your body that are illegal. Mm Mm-mm. You won't do things that not only dishonor God, but break the law, hurt and harm your neighbor. You won't steal. You won't be a thief. No, no, none of those things. Fruit of the Spirit abounds in your life. There is no law against those things. Amen. That's what God's called us to be. I told my kids, if you'll live for God and be full of the Holy Ghost, there'll be diseases you won't ever catch. I'm going, I'm, I'm not going to call the names, but the latest statistics say that one in every four adults in America have a sexually transmitted disease. I want to ask you young people, can you point to me which one they are? Out of four of them standing side by side by side, are you going to pick one and determine which one? You better be full of the Holy Ghost. You better not be unequally yoked to somebody that's not loving Jesus and full of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because you're going to pick the wrong one. But if you'll stay full of God, you won't ever have none of that. Hello? Say, you won't ever have none of that. Why? Because God will keep you from it. But they'll laugh at me, Brother Eddie, but they'll make fun of me. Dare to be different. You don't know, young lady, but every girl in that school will look at you one day and they say, I wish to God I would have been like her. I wish I would have done it right. I wish I would have done it God's way. There are less scars, less pain. Every young man will stare at you. They'll make fun of you outwardly, but on the inside, they'll wish they could be like you. Because God's hand will be upon your life. I could live my life over again. I wouldn't have been no baseball player. I'd have been a teenage preacher, Lord willing. If that's what he had called me to do as a teenager, I wouldn't have spent, spent my years chasing those things. I'd have spent the years instead of running with those boys on that ball team I'd have been talking to them about Jesus I might have played but I'm saying my aspirations wouldn't have been Major League Baseball my aspirations would have been doing the will of God you know what every one of them boys for the most part lost been married three four times kids scattered all over the countryside I go to go to a reunion they're my buddies. I mean, buddies. We were brothers at one time. I can walk in a room, and they all scatter. Eddie's preaching now. Don't talk around him. Sad, man. Breaks my heart for him. I dare to be different. I want to help those boys. I want to show them there's a better life, a better way. You don't have to live like that no more. I want to minister to them. I do. I want to minister to my brethren that have lost their way. I want to minister to young people that got their eyes on the world instead of on Jesus. I want to be like a lighthouse, a compass where they can find their bearings and say, this is the way. Walk ye in it. Hallelujah. Is that your desire tonight? I dare to be different in a world of compromise. That ain't much of an Easter message, but it's the one that God gave me. 
for tonight. Let's find us a place around this altar. Let's commit our ways unto him. Acknowledge him in all of our ways and let him direct 